in this video i will be talking about the spatial transformer the spatial transformer is a mechanism for incorporating spatial attention in images to provide an example of the importance of spatial attention i have shown an example of a cheetah which is camouflaged uh, in this particular uh, in the image on the left and as you can see by focusing on a relevant part of the image containing the cheetah the re the resulting image is such that it becomes much easier to classify this is because image recognition tasks are often fooled by the irrelevant clutter in the image and attention helps focus the uh, image onto portions that are more relevant for classification purposes now uh, aside from focusing on specific parts of the image there are other aspects of the image that sometimes make classification more difficult for example objects may sometimes be rotated or scaled in strange ways and uh, having a and being able to transform these images back to their natural position often makes classification easier with some objects it, uh, they are rotation invariant that means that if you rotate the image it doesn't matter to the classification process with other objects they are harder to classify if the image somehow gets rotated in some way so here we have an example where the image of the cheetah has gotten rotated somehow and by both magnifying and rotating the image it becomes easier to classify the resulting image on the right now uh, the spatial transformer will uh, provide a natural way to pair these different types of transformation such as scaling as well as uh, the rotation and in fact all of these transformations since they are linear transformations they are naturally paired together via matrix multiplication now there are two types of attention Uh, that are commonly used one is called soft attention and the other is called hard attention so in hard attention mechanism we use reinforcement learning to focus on specific parts of the image so for example in the cheetah example that i showed in an earlier slide uh, you would use reinforcement learning to zero in on specific pixel values where it's more likely to be fruitful to explore the image on the other hand soft attention mechanisms they use learned weights it's a completely different approach where you weight the different pixel values so the more relevant parts of the image you will weight them more heavily in order to create a new image and this new image uh, is is also uh, also contains more relevant parts of the original image which makes it easier for classification on the other hand in another in another video i have discussed the se net which is a different method for spatial attention that's channel wise attention what it does is that it weights different channels by multiplying them with channel specific weights so for example uh, if you applied it uh, to the input feature map what it would happen is that typically it would multiply the color scheme of the channel the red green blue with different uh, weights resulting in a new color scheme uh, for the different image which uh, improves the ability to classify it so the um, Uh, the spatial transformer is very similar to the se net in the sense that uh, it is modular in nature now the se net i have discussed in another video so to relate this what i am discussing here to se net you may want to watch the other video and what uh, it does is that you can take any existing neural network and incorporate the Uh, module the attention module between a pair of convolution layers so and what it does is that you take one convolution layer incorporate the spatial transformer module and it will produce another convolution layer which is exactly of the same size now note that asinet also does exactly the same thing except that the nature of the module is different however other than this insertion of the module between layers there is no change to the existing architecture so in that sense the approach has some of the characters of the meta learner in that you have a module which you can incorporate between uh, any pair of layers and, and uh, then you enjoy the performance improvements of whatever architecture that you started with so let's look a little bit about what the capabilities of the spatial transformer are before we get into the specific architecture of the transformer what it can do is that it can perform all kinds of linear transformations rotation reflection scaling 
and also translation. Now, translation technically is not a linear transformation. So you need to make some modifications to the original approach linear to, to allow translation. And the transformation, it is specific to your data set. It's specific to the task you're using. So for example, image recognition uh, or object recognition, and it's specific to the image at hand. And the reason why it's so specific to a particular task or data set is that this spatial transform module also has parameters which are learned specific to a particular training data set. So for example, if your training data set is such that all the objects are rotated in some way for some reason, then it will learn for that specific training data set that well, rotating the images in this way is good for classification. Rotating, rotating images with these specific characters is good for this classification. So the transformation is, is data driven. And now, uh, the, the other point is that how do these transformations lead to attention? Because one of the uh, um, transformations that uh, this module allows is that of magnification. So when you magnify the image, so when you translate an image to a specific part of, uh, part of it and then you magnify it, what will lead, what it will cause is that it will lead to cropping of other parts of the image. So you're essentially attending to the to a, to a new center of attention. And, and so this approach is actually more general than just that cropping or focusing on specific parts of the image because it's allowing other types of linear transformation, allowing rotation and so on. Now, the other point is that this approach also allows learned spatial invariance. So what does spatial invariance mean? If you move the image around a little bit, uh, often the classification is not affected. But of course, the relation of the objects with respect to each other, it, it's image specific. And because this approach is learned, the it, it is a little bit better because it can do it in a data-driven data, data -driven manner as compared to max pooling, which uses the same transformation for all images. So th this also provides a replacement for the max pooling operator. So let's look at the components of the transformer module. The transformer module has three components. The first component is what is called a localization network. Now this localization network is essentially a regression network. So its output is a regression layer and it has six outputs. So when you input an image in a convolution block, it generates six image specific values. And these six image specific values, they are reshaped into a three cross two matrix. And this three cross two matrix defines the mapping between the old and new image coordinates. So, uh, so, so remember that your image is typically a grid of pixels and you'll have coordinates. So suppose you have 28 cross, cross 28 grid and we will consistently use a 28 cross 28 grid example throughout this video. All your coordinates are essentially pairs of integers draw, uh, where the X coordinate is drawn from one through 28 and the Y coordinate is drawn from one to 28. So, it's, so you have this grid of pixels, which gives you the coordinates of the different pixels. And what it does is that it takes these 28 cross 28 values and the grid generator, it transforms these uh, coordinates with the generated matrix. Now, what operation we will use with the matrix, we'll discuss in later slides, but it uses a matrix multiplication along with the translation. And what, results by doing this multiplication that it results in fra new fractional coordinates. Now, fractional coordinates are a bit of a problem because uh, grid coordinates for pixels are always integer values. So if you have a 28 cross 28 grid, all X coordinates of the grid are somewhere between one and 28 and all Y coordinates from the grid are between uh, one and 28. But here you get fractional coordinates, but as we'll see, uh, it's fairly easy to use this fractional coordinate by interpolating from the nearest pixels. So uh, that's the job of the sampler, which is the third component. So, so we'll go into the specific details of each of these different modules. But before we do so, we'll um, discuss some linear algebra basics because we need these linear algebra basics in order to understand uh, how the transformation is happening from a spatial grid, how all these rotations, reflections, and scalings are happening. So, Let's focus on a two dimensional row vector of coordinates. So let's say you have a 28 cross 28 grid, all your row coordinates, they will be a pair of integers drawn between one and 28, which gives you the coordinate of that pixel. Now, 
this uh, this this is a two dimensional row vector now if i multiply this two dimensional row vector with any square 2 cross 2 matrix a that that always this is a fundamental result in linear algebra that's a combination of a rot reflection and scaling along two perpendicular directions and uh, this result follows from what is known as the polar decomposition theorem so what the polar decomposition theorem says is that you, you take any square matrix a you can express it as a product of an orthogonal matrix U. Uh, so and what an orthogonal matrix does is that if you multiply a vector with it, it rot reflects the vector. That's a combination of rotation and reflection and uh, a positive definite matrix. So it's a product of an orthogonal matrix and the positive semi-definite matrix. So let's say you have I, J, the pair of coordinates. I've shown equation six over here. The I, J, when you multiply it with U, it will result in a new pair of coordinates which is rotated with respect to the origin. So it rotates it about the origin or it could reflect it because U is a rot reflection matrix. And then when you post multiply with the matrix S, which is a positive semi-definite matrix, what it does is that it scales along two orthogonal di directions. So uh, again, about the origin, those coordinates is going to scale them and those two directions will depend on the eigenvectors of your positive semi-definite matrix. Now, recall that the positive semi-definite matrix, it always has uh, uh, eigenvalues which are orthogonal to each other. So it will scale along two mutually orthogonal uh, directions. And the eigenvalues, they, are, they, will, they will define your scaling factor. Uh, scaling factors. Now, note that the scaling factors could be different along the two, direction, uh, two directions if they are, if, if the values of the eigenvalues are different. So what that means is that it could also result in some distortions to, uh, to the image. So let's say that you have a scatter plot ij of 28 cross 28 values, which is a square grid. If you, once you perform this transformation, this plot of xij, yij, what you can show that because the polar decomp decomposition theorem is that it will always be a rotated uh, and scaled parallelogram. So it could be a smaller parallelogram or it could be a larger parallel depending on the magnitude of the eigenvalue and it could be rotating depending on the matrix U or it could even be reflected. So uh, of course, uh, this multiplication with a matrix only gives you rotations and scalings about the origin. The origin is invariant in a linear transformation. But of course, when we are talking about attention, we want to focus on a specific part of the image. So when we are talking about, for example, a cheetah being in the left corner of an image, you want to uh, magnify the left corner of the image more. So translation is also needed. Now, that can be done by using a trick that we often use in machine learning, how we incorporate bias variables in machine learning. What we do is that we, you take your two-dimensional coordinate i, j, and you add a one, you append a one. So you make it a three-dimensional coordinate with a value of one. And similarly, the matrix A, instead of using a two cross two matrix, you use a three cross two matrix where the last pair of rows defines the X translation and the Y translation. So now when you multiply I, J, 1 with A, you are going to again get your coordinates, your X, I, J, and Y, I, J, except that depending on the values in the last row, your uh, coordinates are also going to get translated. Now, these six entries of A, since you have a three plus two matrix, uh, these six entries of A, they are produced by the localization matrix, uh, by the localization network in an image specific manner. So, uh, in a sense, it's going for, for a given image data set, it's going to learn because your localization network has parameters. So, when you train over a specific data set, your localization network learns what kinds of translations are relevant to what types of images. And this location network, it can be a convolution and a neural network, or it, even, it can even be a fully connected network. Then you have <clears throat> what is called the grid generator. So the grid generator defines your coordinate, mate, uh, coordinate mapping. So remember that your pixels, again, they are, when we are considering this 28 cross 28 example of a grid, you have these coordinates of pixels which are pairs of integers. And you need to map how a pair of integers in the original and transformed image relate to each other. So uh, you do that by taking the 
origin, the, the coordinate in the transformed image. So it's easier to reverse map. So what, what do you do? Let's say that you have a coordinate two, three in the transformed image, and you want to know what the pixel values uh, corresponding to the coordinate two, three in transformed image is. So what you do, you take this coordinate ij, you append the value one to it to, to allow the transformation, and then you post multiply with a to get the coordinates xij, yij in the original image. Now note that because you're reverse mapping, you are going to uh, get, get the inverse transformation because you're not transforming from the original to the transformed image. You're, tra you're translating the coordinates of the transformed image to the, you're mapping them to how they relate to the original image. So you're going to get an inverse mapping. What does that mean? So the scaling factors. So for example, if the eigenvalues of S are less than one, then the scaling factor is one over S. Uh, it, uh, so, so the scaling factor, the inverse of the eigenvalues. Similarly, if you look at the matrix U, if the matrix U rotates uh, clockwise, then it's going to rotate counterclockwise instead. But nevertheless, you can perform all transformations uh, that you can uh, do with a forward mapping. Now, uh, once you have this, uh, th these values xij, yij, you have to map the pixels in the original image to values of the pixels in the transformed image. Now, one problem, of course, is that uh, while the, we started with pixel values, with integer pixel values in the transformed image, we map to x, i, j, y, j, which could be fractional values because we are multiplying with a real matrix. We are multiplying i, j, one with a real matrix A. So you could get fractional values of x, i, j, y, i, j in the original image. So this seems to be a problem because you need to map discrete coordinate values to discrete coordinate values. But there's a solution. You can use interpolation from the four surrounding pixels of xij, yij uh, in the source image. So what you can do is you can average those the values in those four pixels depending on how uh, the distance of xij, yij from those four different uh, pixels. And, and this solution actually is quite desirable because discrete mappings from pixels to pixels, they are not differentiable. But these kinds of interpolated mappings, they are differentiable at most points, uh, and it results in a sub-differentiable mapping, and that's good for backpropagation. And so here I've given you the sampling component, how you perform the differentiable operation. So you have the original pixel values, H, M, N, Q, that's on the right-hand side, the very last value, that's the value of the pixel at coordinate M, N, Q. So you take all those pixel values which are within a distance of one from x, i, j, y, i, j. So that's the purpose of this max function. What it's going to do is that it's only going to pick out values of m and n which are within a distance of one from x, i, j, y, i, j. And those are basically the four surrounding pixels of x, i, j, y, i, j. And you're going to get fractions in each case. It's going to multiply. Uh, so these maxes will result in fractions in each case, which are less than one, depending on how far it is from that pixel value. And then you multiply those uh, two fractions, multiply with the value of H, M, and Q, and you add them up. So even though this summation has 28 cross 28 terms, only four of those terms will be non-zero. And that will give you the new pixel x prime ijq, which is your transform pixel. So here I've shown an example of what it looks like. So you have an image which is uh, rotated and let's say you want to do uh, spatial recognition. So after you perform the transformation, the new image is going to look like the image on the right. So basically the, there's some rotation has been done and uh, the, the, it shows the face very clearly, which is good for facial recognition. Now, uh, in some cases, you may not want to have rotation. Now, uh, how do you perform uh, the transformation so that you use it only for attention? That means you, that you only want to magnify the image. And the other thing you want to do is that while magnifying, you want the magnification in both directions to be the same. So note that the in the original, uh, transformation, the magnification in two directions could be different. So a square could get distorted to a parallelogram. But let's say you want to magnify in an equal way along all directions. Then what you do is that the, the matrix A, you just have to change the matrix A. You just have to force your localization network to create a different matrix A. 
So what you want to do is that the upper two cross two sub matrix of the three cross two matrix is a diagonal matrix with a value of S in both ends. This S essentially defines the scaling factor. In fact, because you're doing the reverse transformation, the scaling factor is one over S in this case. So uh, what it's going to do is going to scale the image by uh, by one over s in all directions. And this will uh, and because you're scaling by an equal value in both directions, this is not going to result in any distortion of a square to a parallelogram. And then the lowest row of a, uh, they are real values. They contain the translations defining the center of attention. So so in this case, you really need only three values, s and the two values in the lower row. So what your localization network, all you need to do is that your localization network, you need to change its architecture. You need to change its output layer so that it just outputs one sigmoid, which is your s, which is between zero and one, and two real values. That's all you need to do. And that is basically going to give you uh, a transformation which which gives you only attention, no rotation. Now, uh, the, 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 by changing the location network, you can actually perform more sophisticated transformation. You can even work with 3D voxels and project to 2D images by defining appropriate linear transformation. So the approach is actually quite flexible because if you have some understanding about the nature of your data, well, rotations don't matter in this data set or rotations do matter in this data set or maybe the data should be scaled in a certain way, then you can incorporate that into your localization network and your transformation matrices to perform only those types of transformation. And the details are given in the paper. I have the reference here. Uh, the last bullet point of this slide contains a reference to the paper. And they, they also have some experiments uh, in their paper where they even used it on distorted uh, MNIST images. So it was able to attend to important parts of the image while making relevant transformation. And even for distorted MNIST image, it was often able to correct for those distortions. Uh, it also uh, provided a good replacement for the max pooling layer, which uh, is useful for incorporating learned spatial invariance. So now uh, this approach is uh, very similar in principle to SENet. Now SENet is a channel-wise attention mechanism, which I discussed in a different video. What SENet does is that it changes the weightings of the different channels, but it keeps the spatial pixels, the relative values of the spatial pixels the same. So what it means is that, for example, if you apply it to an input layer, it would result in a change in the color scheme, but the basic shapes in the image would remain the same. So here I've shown an example where the X uh, becomes clearer because of applying channel-wise weighting. Of course, the channel-wise weighting is actually usually applied to hidden layers rather than the input layer, but, the, but I've shown the input layer here because it's easier to visualize. The, uh, the spatial transformation uh, transformer is a bit different because it performs spatial transformations, but the color scheme remains the same as the original image. So you're not reweighting the different channels. So all channels are being transformed in the same way. And because of this, this approach, the, the two approaches are actually complementary and they can be used in combination with one another. Thank you very much.